This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the truth to the free peoples of the world. Out of the grey mists of the North Sea, a bomber comes roaring over the coast of Britain with a Soviet star on the wings. Very few were privileged to see it, and those who saw kept well the secret of the arrival of the man from Moscow. In a few moments, a sturdy figure, well wrapped up, descends. Soviet Commissar for Foreign Affairs, right-hand man to Stalin himself. Mr. Molotov is accompanied by a member of the Red Army General Staff, and their coming is the best augury for the future close cooperation of Britain and Russia in the war against Hitler's Germany. <music> Men of the Royal Air Force at this aerodrome soon got friendly with their opposite numbers from Moscow, as far as language difficulties allowed. These are the commander and crew of the bomber that brought our distinguished visitor. Mr. Molotov has been back inside the bomber to change from his flying kit. The Soviet Air Force sent its own ground crew to service the plane, and they remained at the aerodrome to prepare it for its transatlantic flight to America. Cars were waiting to take the little group onto the station to catch the special train for London, to hammer out a steel bond between two great nations at grips with the mightiest destructive force the world has ever known. left the little wayside station and hastened south through the neat fields, so different from the vast plains of the Soviet Union, but standing to lose all equally with Russia if Hitler should triumph. The train draws into another station, not a great London terminus, but another wayside halt amid the fields. And here is Mr. Eden, the Foreign Secretary, who has done so much to bring about a closer alliance of our two countries. Mr. Maisky, Soviet ambassador, had joined his chief en route. country road from the station are British bobbies keeping the peace and the secret. Also in the group to welcome the visitors are General Nye, Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff and Sir Alexander Cadogan, Permanent Secretary to the Foreign Office and a lady who couldn't resist a peep, but also kept the secret. Any excitement in Downing Street? No, very quiet. They had come in the back way, and after exchanges of compliments and more welcomes, they left by the garden door. Mr. Churchill, and indeed all of them, looking very well satisfied with the occasion. A historic scene in this quiet garden of the most famous house in London, where the world's greatest statesmen have trod. said goodbye at the back gate while the front door remained closed, and they piled into cars, Mr. Molotov and Mr. Maisky and Mr. Eden in a friendly crowd on the back seat. And so beneath the barrage balloon, 
through unsuspecting London, which noticed nothing unusual. But we are privileged to accompany them across the park to the Foreign Office, where the Treaty of Alliance is to be signed. It was the Tuesday after Whitson, here in the Foreign Minister's room. The morning's news had told of a Whitson spent at home. From Moscow, we had learned of Timoshenko's great battle of the wedges at Kharkov. From Paris, of a gun battle in the streets. And this unreported drama, no less charged with significance, this was London. Obstacles had been overcome. Differences between Britain and the Soviet Union had been smoothed over in the common need to present a united front against Hitler's tyranny. A firm treaty of alliance in war and cooperation in the no less difficult and dangerous days of peace to follow. That was being settled and sealed. The treaty which we have just signed engage, engages us to continue the struggle together until the victory be won. On behalf of my colleagues, I give you the pledge that there will be no wavering in this endeavor on the part of the government or the people of these islands. Such then is the first chapter of our task, the overthrow of Hitler and the destruction of all that his regime stands for. But there is a second chapter also to our treaty. One day the war will end. One day the common enemy will be defeated and there will be peace again. We must see to it that this time peace endures. In the treaty which we have signed, we pledge ourselves to work together for this purpose. Mr. Molotov replied in Russian, underlining the terms and aims of the treaty. <coughs> the urgency of opening a second front in Europe in 1942 had also been discussed and agreed. It was the war's best kept secret, and although we all recognize that it's easier to sign than to carry out, make no mistake, they had been signing Hitler's sentence of death. Still in secrecy, from a remote landing field somewhere in Britain, that black Soviet bomber took off with Monsieur Molotov for America, closing the second act of a most tremendous drama. And nobody knew anything about it at all, not even the policemen. That's the way to victory, keeping calm and quiet on the outside and producing the kind of punch that delivers a knockout. <laughs> 